And now, folks, it's my pleasure to introduce Sandra Higgins, who will talk about uh, Eden Farm Animal Sanctuary and vegan, Matilda's Promise Vegan Education Centre, and also give us a bit of background about the movie You Haven't Lived Until You've Hugged the Talkie. So. I'd like to use this evening to introduce you to Eden Farm Animal Sanctuary and Matilda's Promise Vegan Education Centre and to the other animals on whose behalf you advocate. Before I do that, there are a few people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank the Vegan Ireland uh, Committee, Aga, Gloria and Irina, for inviting me here this evening and giving me an opportunity to show the movie. And I'd like to thank Bernie, Ed and Roger for previewing the movie and advising on it, and Roger in particular for promoting the movie over the last few months. I'd like to thank the activists and scientists for their advice and contributions. My editor, Andrew Baxter, Declan for his friendship and lifts to the vet. Unfortunately, we'll make quite a few trips to the vet. I'd like to thank Sif for his artwork, Sebastian for doing the website and his support, Shani who works with me at Eden, and without whose love for the turkeys, the movie would not have happened. And I'd like to thank Ronnie, my partner and special friend, for supporting me while I made the movie and for giving the residents of Eden their home. So this is Dorothy and Marjorie, two of the residents at Eden. Very briefly, I'll introduce you to the history of the sanctuary. I'll introduce you to some of the residents. I'll explain why I opened the education centre and why I made the movie. So in May 2008, the first farmed animals arrived at Eden. They were Bertie and Cara, two lambs. Both of them were triplets born to different mothers who were unable to look after them. Shortly afterwards, the first chickens arrived at Eden. They were rescued from a petting farm where they were used in a breeding program and they were due to be slaughtered. So actually, we weren't vegan when we first opened the sanctuary. I became vegan as I got to know other animals. And one of the first things that I learned about them was that we have a common biology. For instance, we all have two eyes, two ears, a nose and a mouth. We even have eyebrows and eyelashes in common, as you can see in this photograph of Willow. So their sentience began to enter my consciousness in a way that it hadn't before. I learned that they have family and friends that are important to them, and that their psychological makeup is very similar to our own. One of the really important things I learned about them is their enormous capacity for pleasure. This is never more obvious than in the children of all species. And one of the loveliest sights in Eden were the, the lambs when they used to jump on their forelegs, when they literally used to jump for joy. So as I saw sights like this, the words leg of lamb began to jar on my consciousness. And I started to investigate our treatment of other animals. And what I learned shattered me. I've specialised in psychotraumatology for most of my career working as a psychologist and I'm very familiar with the signs of trauma and I know that I suffered vicarious trauma from what I learned happens then and if I suffered that by witnessing it on a television or a video screen, what must they endure by what's inflicted on me? So a sanctuary can be defined as a place of refuge and safety and the word also has religious connotations of sacredness and paradise. This is evident in, the, in the, the word in Eden that I use to name the sanctuary. Now, I'm not a religious person myself. I prefer rational explanations, and a lot of the time I actually find them to be more compassionate. But we do try and make uh, Eden a special type of paradise, a sacred place for the residents. And for this reason, Eden is not a visitor centre. It's not open to the public. It's simply a home for the residents. At the moment, we have 102 residents. They include chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, sheep and cats, and will soon have pigs. Most of them have been abused or abandoned, or otherwise oppressed by our use of them for food in animal agriculture, and actually in backyard situations. We, we've learned a lot since we opened Eden about the cruelty that's involved in, in people supposedly humanely keeping animals in backyard situations. At Eden, we offer the residents a lifelong home. We have a policy of not rehoming anyone who enters our doors. So I use my experience as a psychologist with humans to help me with the, with the non-human residents at Eden. 
uh, from the species of from the perspective of trans species psychology, we certainly have more in common biologically, psychologically, and socially than the differences that are sometimes used to justify our oppression of them. In the aftermath of violation, we all experience the same emotions. They are fear, despair, helplessness. You can see these emotions in Freeman's eyes in this photograph. This was taken on the day that Freeman arrived. He had a neurological disorder and nobody wanted him. He'd had three or four different homes before he arrived in Bucks. He wasn't wanted by humans and he wasn't wanted by the other animals he lived with either. When he arrived with us, he couldn't stand and he was starving. And you can see the defeat and the terror in his eyes. But this is the same defeat and terror that I see in the traumatised humans I deal with. There's no difference in our suffering. The same interventions that help us humans recover from trauma help non-human animals. And sometimes they're quite simple. They involve stability, safety, love and compassion. You can see the results in Joy. And this photograph was taken just a week after she was rescued. She adjusted to her new home very fast. The residents at Eden teach us about themselves and about how our use of them hurts them. One group of animals, of non-human animals, that we've learned a lot about are egg-laying hens. The hens in this photograph were rescued from what most people think is a humane or harmless situation. Somebody just keeping a few hens in the back garden for, so that they can use their eggs. But believe me, there is nothing harmless about this situation. This group in particular have suffered a very high rate of illness and of death. You see, hens in the wild just lay one or two clutches of eggs a year for the purposes of rearing their own children. The egg-laying hens that come to Eden, the hens that provide the eggs that most humans eat, are bred to lay an egg every day. And this takes an enormous toll on their health. And actually, it's the human equivalent of having a menstrual cycle and childbirth every day. There's no such thing as a humane egg. This is Dorothy, Marjorie and Lucinda, three of the geese at Eden. Unfortunately, we no longer have Lucinda. Running a sanctuary can be very challenging. The residents' health is compromised at the outset because of the fact that they're bred to produce food for humans. They're also traumatised by the treatment meted out to them at human hands. Every day we're faced with ethical dilemmas. We're never sure that we're doing the right thing and sometimes we have to make very fast decisions. So it's, it's always difficult. It's not a natural situation to interfere in their lives in the first place. We always have financial worries. And there's nothing worse than knowing that we have sick ones in the sanctuary and not enough money to care for their health. So what's the problem? And our sanctuary is the answer to that problem. Without undermining the value, the value of sanctuaries for individual lives, I think it's worth pointing out that sanctuaries without education are for the benefit of the few, but not the many. And I believe it is the many we need to concern ourselves with. There are billions of non-human animals who need to be rescued, but it's impractical to think that sanctuaries can cope. Sanctuaries are not the answer to our use of other animals. We need to stop breeding them. For this reason, I opened Matilda's <coughs> Promise Vegan Education Centre. Matilda was a wonderful hen. She came to us in January 2009. She was a very special character, extremely friendly. Most, most hens are very friendly, but Matilda was very engaging. And even people who don't like non-human animals used to melt when they interacted with her. She would jump up and, and share the food on your plate. And she used to wait at our kitchen, kitchen window and spend quite a bit of the day in the house with us, even though she had a choice. She could have been with the other animals if she had wanted to. She loved us and, and we loved her. Unfortunately, we no longer have her. So why did I make this movie, You Haven't Lived Until You've Hugged a Turkey? I wanted people to know who turkeys are. And I wanted people who eat turkeys to know who they're eating. The movie is a representation of non-human animals in the light in which we know and love them at Eden. Visitors to Eden often express surprise when they see how we are with the residents, but I don't think that that's anything particular to us. I do think it's something particular to the non-human animals at Eden. I think there's an inherent trust and love 
that farmed animals have for humans, even for the humans who use them. I think it's Gail Eisnitz who describes how calves will attempt to suckle the fingers of the slaughterhouse workers prior to being killed. And I personally have seen turkeys run in affection to the people who were going to slaughter them. It makes our betrayal of them all the worse. The movie is situated in the context of scientific facts on sentience and cognition in other animals. For instance, Eric Jarvis describes that while the avian brain has developed or evolved to develop a slightly different structure to the primate brain, they actually function in much the same way. So the avian brain doesn't just rely or, be, or act on instinct, it's an intelligent brain in the same way that the human or the primate brain is. The reason I did this is I didn't want the movie to be dismissed as the product of the imagination of an eccentric, a mad woman with turkeys, or even as anecdotal evidence. It's rooted in scientific fact, because I believe I have a responsibility to make others aware of those facts, as I became aware of them. The movie is designed for non-vegans, and thus it parallels my own journey to veganism to some extent. It's deliberately positive in order to attract non-vegan viewers. Now one of the reasons I did this is that I learned uh, through the study of positive psychology that we naturally focus on what is negative in life. It's understandable that we do this, it, it helps us to survive. But actually we can learn a lot by studying the very best in life. And I think the turkeys at, at Eden represent the best that they can be given that they've been bred to produce food for humans. Very often we can learn an awful lot by looking at, 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 at flourishing and at thriving rather than at the negative. So I'd like you to feel free to use the movie in your own outreach. It's free to view on www.matildaspromise.org and I'd also encourage you to use the information on that website. So to the best of my ability, I've allowed the turkeys in this movie to speak in their own voices. We often see the non-human animals we oppress referred to as the voiceless. I do not believe they are voiceless. They have voices and they use them constantly. It is no reflection on them that we do not understand their language. But we share a common body language and a language of emotion through which they have a lot to tell us if we listen. In the movie, you haven't lived until you've hugged a turkey. They use this common language to give an account of who they are. Their story is rooted in scientific fact and their voices are joined in this documentary by the voices of the scientists who investigate their lives. Together they illustrate that other animals have comparative cognitive and sensory capacities to our own that enable them to experience and to be aware of the suffering that our use inflicts on them. They are not voiceless. Listen to them and they will speak to you of justice and of love.